Welcome to another edition of A Travel Talk Show. And uh, we're broadcasting from self-hibernation, practicing physical distancing. Of course, of course. In British Columbia, beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Glad to be here, Greg. My name, I'm your co-host. My name is Greg Gerard. I'm a co-founder with acanatravel.com, uh, public speaker, community consultant, and uh, rank number 23, top 1,000 travel bloggers globally by Global Rise. And right over here. My name's Colin Gerard. I'm co-founder of Acana Travel, uh, head tech department, and uh, glad to be here. We're glad to have you, Call. Um, a nickname we go by is uh, A Team Brothers, so that would be E H Team Brothers. Um, just thought I'd throw that out there. So we broadcast every Tuesday uh, on Facebook Live, starting at 7 p.m. PST. And in our broadcast, uh, we like to invite guests uh, from all around the world. And one of our favorite parts of our show is called the A Agenda and we outline what we're going to talk about today. So number one, as usual, uh, we'll be covering a little bit about this week in tourism. Um, number two, Colin, special guest tonight, who will be coming on our show in, uh, in about 10 minutes time, is Professor Ken Coates. He is a Canadian Research Chair in Regional Innovation at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Ken is also McDonald Laurier Institute Senior Policy Fellow in Aboriginal and Northern Canadian Issues. And he's also a very well respected writer. He's written uh, how many books, Call? Uh, over two dozen, as far as I know. Uh, third, uh, another part of our show, we have our Shameless Plugs episode and uh, a lot of information about where we're going, what we're building, what we're doing. And number four is a new feature. New big production, big budget, feature. big budget. It's <laughs> called the Isolation Vacation. And what we've done, Colin, mm -hmm. is we're going to point out out of all the parks and everything we've done, we're going to point out some of our favorites and we put little clips together to finish the show with. Um, and we're going to point some uh, of our highlights that we've gone through across Canada in our massive little uh, study research road trip. Sounds exciting, Greg. Always I good to see so. places we've been to bring back the uh, the adventure memories. Uh, let people know this is Facebook Live. So we are publisher, editor, director, lighting, actors, producers, and everything on this all at the touch of a keyboard and you can interact so if you look below uh facebook live for you newbies out there um you can say hi to us we know last week we had them all the way from across canada called pei uh new brunswick bc alberta so let's see give a shout out tell us where you're from don't you think call for sure. It's great. Everybody that joins us from all over Canada, we're glad to have you and let us know what you think. Just a little side note, if you notice, uh, Ken Coates, he is actually from Saskatchewan. So in honor of our guest, we've put a nice little Saskatchewan background uh, on our little format tonight. That's the thing with Saskatchewan too, you know, they've got over 10,000 lakes in the north. They've got these beautiful rolling hills in the south. And like I tell everyone when you're going for Saskatchewan, Go and see it. It's a beautiful province. Just get off the number one highway. Yeah, get off the beaten path and it's beautiful. Ah, I agree. What we're going to talk about is a little bit about the industry. Uh, we got a little history for you. Uh, I saw this in an article I was reading and it's, uh, did you know tourism started in Europe, the concept of tourism, right? And it was enjoyed just by the elite, right? Okay. So what happened in 1960s, and I didn't know it was this soon, but 1960s, travel became affordable and accessible with the introduction of jetliners. So now, all of a sudden, that opened everything up in the 60s. I thought it was a little earlier, but I guess the 60s does make sense, right? Yeah, I guess you had local tourism before then, just not as much international. From the information I'm gathering is that tourism, because, I mean... Let's not spin it. Uh, it's in a, it's in a lot of trouble. Small and uh, rural communities are, are are we've got a it's a it's a dead stop on the tourism meter right now. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that 
people, they're, they're starting to prioritize different and money is becoming an issue. So tourism might become a luxury again for many Canadians, overseas tourism, that type of tourism. Yeah. And there's a lot of factors which we're going to talk about in, in a little bit of a second here. But do you think, Call? do you think Canadians are going to have, for one, enough money to go on major trips? And two, then there's the job factor, right? So that's going to change who's traveling, where they're traveling. That's just it. I mean, it's not uh, only how much money you have, but can you afford to take another two weeks off to go somewhere? Yep. And I mean, everybody's going to be behind the eight ball and uh, work and get caught up and ahead. So yep. little trips or small vacations, I think, is probably where it's at. Yeah. I, I read something else, too. They're saying that the market shift is happening on who's going to do the traveling. Uh, some of the experts are saying that the travelers are going to be more of the seniors now because what's happening is the seniors have that that money and they aren't tied down to a job. And mm -hmm. what they're saying is they're also, because of what's going on, they're getting more uh, educated on how to use the Internet. So here's some of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to call it the unknowns and the knowns um, because in our industry, mm -hmm. um, with this, there's a whole bunch of unknowns in our industry that are going to affect the outcome down the road. And like you and I have said, this is a domino effect in our industry. This is step one. There's going to be a lot of other stuff coming down the pipe, yeah, um, sure. which we've covered in previous episodes. But mm -hmm. here's an unknown. Now, how does Ottawa dig, dig itself out of out of debt? How does it affect and the, the policies are put in place on how they're going to dig, dig themselves out of debt? How is that going to affect? The household income so if it takes away a lot of that household income more more of these you know taxes uh recession and all this different things that we're going to run into bank rates uh visa card all this stuff mm -hmm. um how's that going to affect the household income again that's what's going to affect travel yes right yeah so travel is definitely a luxury yeah and, and and the thing is as i've said from the get-go and you've said it too travel has a lot of tentacles Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of things that goes out and it hits and affects and hits and affects. And then what happens? You start chopping off tentacles. That one tentacle off affects another in a big way. Right. Yeah. So that's one. One is the here's another thing that I'm, I've been reading is that the business travel market might dry up. Here's what here's what they're mm -hmm. saying. They're mm -hmm. saying because of the online communication technology tools out there, businesses mm -hmm. are starting to see that you can get a lot accomplished. You might not have that physical uh, interaction, but you get a lot accomplished. And what they're doing, the bottom line is they got to decide, do we have a video conference or do we spend 20,000 bucks, $20,000 in travel expenses to go to the same thing? And now they're all looking since, you know, money's an issue for, for all businesses, big, small. Mm -hmm. Now they're looking at that business travel market, which is a huge market, conventions mm -hmm. act, huge market. Um, might shrink a bit too. And and we talk about this stuff because we think the tourism market needs to know. They need to know mm -hmm. so they can make preparations, they can learn new things, they need to know. So it's important that this stuff comes out, right? Educate, educate. Educate, 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 educate. Exactly. Okay. Unknown. Um, and again, we don't know how this is all going to pan out with physical distancing. So again, and one of the factors is What's going to happen with conferences, sporting events, and venues with large crowds generating millions for communities and regions? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is on the other aspect, the owners of, say, a hockey team, if they're going to have social distancing with the arena, one every five seats, then they're not going to be able to cover their costs. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the dollar at 70 cents, right, for the Canadian hockey team. So, again, these are all little factors that are going to affect everything out yeah. there right it's going to tug pull tug and pull and you know i'm not the one that's just saying this this is i'm reading this on numerous type of articles right mm -hmm. um the united the united nations and i totally agree says tourism is the hardest hit economic sector by covid 19. 1.7 billion travelers internationally came to a dead stop 1.7 yes. billion boom instantly down to, right Nothing. And then yeah. we've got the fact that 50% um, of businesses on a, on a whole bunch of different surveys, 50% of businesses are going to say that if if they can't figure this out, 
right? Because they're closed their doors now because there's no mm -hmm. revenues coming in. If they can't figure this out in three to four months, um, we're going to lose anywhere from 10 to 30% of our small businesses. And mm -hmm. it's probably going to be a higher number in the small and rural communities, which we're passionate about. And mm -hmm. uh, hopefully uh, Ken will, will cover, cover that and come talk to us about that. Here's some of the knowns. Airlines are shrinking. There's uh, fewer flights. Um, they're flying fewer planes. They're canceled their orders for buying planes. They've grounded fleets and they're retiring planes. All of this, where does that put international travel? On the price of a ticket, the flights, there's not going to be as many. There's going to be a lot fewer because the planes, they're, they're retiring. I, I can't remember which airline, but one airline retired 12 planes. So they're predicting that the uh, the industry will be less. I don't, I don't know if, if they're predicting this is i guess this is a hypothesis that's that's floating out there with all mm -hmm. these different factors no one really knows how the airlines are going to come out of this and and mm -hmm. bottom line what's the end ticket price and what's the end access for a traveler yeah right and then there's also the probably will be um there's going to be new and imposed travel restrictions and other limits on travel which is is going to and every country will be the different now one what is there 120 or so countries right now travel restrictions and they're right. going to um they're gonna that will close down the international countries so again with the flight issue the international countries issue the border issues the travel restrictions issues and then of course once you land somewhere then you've got to go through all of their systems based on how they reacted to COVID. i mean it's it there's so many dominoes right insane yeah yeah so tourism is closed for the season not much we can do to fix that we can't bring travelers not safe we, we can't fix that right mm -hmm. so um which is you know you can't fix the lack but what you can do is you can build your online visibility for your community here's what i don't get we got this two to three month four month five month six years two years three year basically i think before we even have a some sort of recovery What's going to happen then is <coughs> I can't figure out why the businesses that are going to do it or the communities that are going to do it, they they, they got this self-isolation time. Man, it's, if like us, I would be creating content like crazy. I would get our experience community program. I would go crazy with content. So when mm -hmm. this does blow over, you dominate social media and you dominate search engines. That's, and that's what I see as, as a way of coming out of this. And that's, again, just for my my experience and there's you could develop seasons target new markets now's the time to get the programs in place to do that and as far as i know our program uh not to our own horn it works wonders triple digit increases it would be perfect for a community right now mm -hmm. community and every business as well it's the time to uh yep. focus your focus and change your your plan so you can come out of it yes all right. Well, I think this is a pretty common and, I, and I'm pretty sure Ken is going to touch on this, but um, every country is going to rely on Canadians, uh, on their on their citizens generating travel dollars within their country because of the border, the plane, all these other outside issues. So everyone's, I yeah. think it's pretty safe to think everyone's going to be traveling Canada and that's mm -hmm. not perfectionism. That's, that's reality. Mm -hmm. And um, they're saying that predictions that it's going to be the first two years where Canada is going to be doing a lot of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. So there is something out of that. I mean, we're educating ourselves about our great land. We're, te we're showing mm -hmm. each other what to do. I mean, we took 10 years to, to study Canada. We went all the way from North, South, West, and all over the plant, all over the country, mm -hmm. uh, thousands of communities, thousands and thousands and thousands of parks. And I can tell you right now, this country is absolutely amazing. Amazing. Yes. You don't need to go so, anywhere else. There's so many differences in different areas. There's so much like yep. BCs different from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland. They all have their unique beauty and um, amazing. Yeah. It, it's most good. people. Go ahead. Everybody's got a spot near, even close to them, or that they haven't been to, that they've been dying to go to. So. Yeah, it's an amazing uh, country. It's a total amazing country, and I think it's uh, and it's something that I think we definitely need to to see and to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're gonna do some shout outs now. How's that? Um, we're gonna wait wild. for uh, let's see, get wait for Ken here to come on. And what we got here is we got uh, Christine. She's doing a shout out from Professor Ken Coates' homeland. She says, "Yay, Sass! Good little shout out there." 
Nice hey, to have Christine. you. Christine. Thanks for joining us. And uh, oh, oh, I think we got a we got a we got a message here. Shamanis loves the bros. <laughs> we've, got, we've got some fans in Shamanis yeah. by the name of uh, uh, Mr. Mike Dump Truck. Yeah, Mikey. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do we got here? We got um, we got Scott Cole. Excellent. Mr. Scott Cole. The, I don't know if all of Duncan misses us. <laughs> I, I don't think they do. And I don't think all of Duncan yeah. does, but it's nice to know one or two do. I mean, it yeah, makes yeah. you feel a little bit better. Susan, good day from Oz. Quality, well-considered, well-targeted content that gets engagement rules. See, go bros. We're going to introduce our next guest, professor at the University of Saskatchewan, Mr. Ken Coates. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background about Ken. Uh, he's a Canadian Research Chair in Regional Innovation in uh, Johnson Shoyama. I hope I said that right. Graduate School of Public Policy. He's also a McDonald Warrior Institute Senior Policy Fellow in Aboriginal and Northern Canadian Issues. Sorry, Welcome I, to the show. Your system, your system kept kicking me out, so I kept trying to come back. Wow, I'm glad you're persistent. It's nothing personal. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing so, I'm Excellent. doing good, Ken. Thanks for joining us nice. uh, from Thank Saskatchewan. You. Glad to have you on our show. So, Ken, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to some questions because I really want to pick your brain, um, and I know our audience does. Uh, we've got some we've got some fellow Saskatonians here watching and tuning in and waiting to hear what you got to say. So, we're gonna jump right to it. Sounds great. So, from a bio, I was we did a um, we did a little poking around, and there's a bio of yours that I found, and it said, uh, "Unless the appropriate steps are taken, the allied shift, the, the alleged shift to knowledge-based high technology comedy could well intensify the challenges faced by small and rural communities and regions." My question, Ken, that was then. This is now. So, how has COVID changed this this whole situation? So it's made it much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, 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 I'm actually a happy person by nature, but there's not much to be happy about right now. Um, one of the things that's going to that's occurring right now is the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a move away from sort of a balanced society with people living in rural areas, small towns, big cities, medium-sized cities, to what I call a city-state economy. And a city-state economy is where you know a handful of big cities gobble up almost all the money, all the attention, and, all, and a lot of the talent. So we actually have five world-class cities uh, across the country. Um, sadly, my beautiful city, home city of Saskatoon, doesn't qualify in that number. We're talking here about Vancouver, um, used to be Calgary, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Ham Hamilton then only doesn't make the list either. These big cities are globally competitive. They're doing extremely well. And the top six cities in Canada are responsible for more than 100% of all the job growth in Canada over the last decade which basically means wow. that the whole rest of the country is losing jobs relative to those oh. big cities. And so what, one of the things that's going on now is, of course, we're moving into a higher tech economy, higher tech society. The advantage goes to big cities, to big universities, to big research institutes, to you know headquarter cities where they have lots of major companies around. Um, we've never properly caught up uh, rural Canada with the Internet. So many of our folks who are in smaller towns, some of you, I hope, are in small towns and, and connected up really well and, and, and moving at the same speed that I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know the, numbers, the number across the country is that many of the rural areas are doing really poorly. And it's quite disgraceful. I mean, I, I, my wife is, uh, runs a, a charity that builds schools in rural Vietnam. We were down there in December. We were down there for about 10 or 12 days, went wow. into maybe 15 small villages high up in the mountains. We never lost connectivity. Wow. wow. Cell phone connectivity, high speed, <laughs> reliable cell phone connectivity, every single second. When our friends in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan will tell you that when you drive from Saskatoon to Regina, every time you go down, you go down a dip in the road, you lose connectivity. <laughs> now, wow. Yeah. <laughs> there's only two dips in the road between Saskatoon and Regina. So, <laughs> not a big crisis. So we yeah. have huge, huge regions in, in rural Canada that have very seriously substandard internet keep, keep connectivity. So one of the things we're discovering now is if you're connected, you have a chance to participate in the 21st century economy, you have a chance to be part of the knowledge economy, you have a chance to promote yourself and sell yourself as an individual, as a company, as a community. Um, if you don't have those skills, boy, do you ever have problems. 
Uh, I'll finish with this one point. Mm -hmm. When you look at many small towns, in particular, I'm, I'm actually from Yukon. So when you talk about beautiful places, Yukon's the best place on the planet. You all know that, right? Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and so, you know, Yukon's a fabulous, fabulous sort of, sort of place. Um, in the smaller towns in the far north, you actually don't have people in those communities generally who can fix computers. You know, if you look in a big city, if you're in Calgary, if you're in Saskatoon, if you're in Ottawa and you got a problem with your computer, you take it down to the store, they fix it for you, get it back operationally, bring somebody into your house if you want. But here in a small town, you, there is no store close by. And so something we take for granted, and that is having a computer that continues to work, a printer that works all the time, a scanner that works, those kinds of things are so commonplace, and yet we really haven't re recognized that many parts of Canada really struggle with that. So I know in the, some of the small towns that I visited recently, there's kind of a local hero. And mm -hmm. it's usually, it, sometimes it's a sort of a you know, computer techie guy who used to be an engineer. Half the time it's a 16-year-old you know, uh, female student from the high school who knows how to make computer work. And when <laughs> something goes down, you phone down the room, hey, Mary, send, send your daughter over. Yeah. You know, <laughs> over and fix to them, which is a great part of rural life. Yes. But we need to be clear about this, that, that we're in the middle of a huge crisis. Um, rural issues have not figured prominently in the federal government's response to this point or to the provincial responses. Uh, we haven't had a long conversation about what's going on. The impact on rural areas will be two to three to four times as high as it'll be on the rural, on the urban areas. I don't picking on the urban areas. They've got challenges of their own. Mm -hmm. um, but we were already in wouldn't quite call it a death spiral. We are already on a downward slope. And I'm seriously worried that if we're not careful and we don't have a deliberate rural revitalization plan, and that's not talking about throwing gazillion government dollars at it. Plans don't always involve government money. We need to have a strategy that says, stand up rural Canada, stand up together, fight for your place in the national scene, make noise, get everybody excited about you, tell people why it's better to live in a rural area than in some 87,000-story high-rise in downtown yep. Toronto. Sorry, Toronto. Um, <laughs> but but I, think, I think we need to be part of that sort of process. So, mm -hmm. you know, and other interesting, other parts of the world are doing a lot better than we are. And so it's not one of these things where you simply say, oh, gee, you know, that's just how it is. It isn't how it is. It's how it's become and how we've let it be. I totally – you've hit so many strong points there, uh, Ken, you know that it's a good segue into the into the next part that I that this is brought up because as you know we're very passionate on trying to do our our little piece of the puzzle. But here's what I'm saying from here's what I'm hearing from the public is that the, the actual COVID pandemic has revealed the cracks in the rural and urban divide. It's actually uh, sort of uh, elevated it out to now it's more of a, a public issue because of of the lack of internet, the lack of the services has really separated the country into have and have nots when it comes to um, what COVID is revealing. So I would agree with you uh, and say it even more strongly probably than you would. Um, mm -hmm. I think you have, you have the haves, you have the have nots and you have the really, really, really have nots. And that last group are mostly first nations communities, you know, and, and if you think rural Canada is not doing well, take a look at rural indigenous communities, rural and remote communities in the far north, fly-in towns, you know, th down 300 miles of gravel road kind of communities. And whatever problems we have in rural Canada are accelerated in indigenous communities, right? And yes, we're seeing those cracks. But do you think the country's paying attention? Do you think Canadians are saying, oh my gosh, we've discovered here, we've ignored the rural Canada for too long. We haven't made good connections. We haven't done the right thing. You're not hearing that. No, uh, we're not here hearing about you know how do you get the factories restarted as we should, you know how do we get the hotels in Vancouver filled up again and we should and cruise ships coming into St John New Brunswick and heading off to Newfoundland we should do all of those things, but we're not hearing is the fact that that we've been leaving rural Canada behind in our sort of national planning, and again this is not it's really too simple in this time day and age to blame the government. We're talking about Canadians as a whole, society as a whole, the CBC as a whole. You know, all these different institutions of ours are consistently ignoring rural Canada. Um, and now we're basically, I think we put the regions very much at risk. Um, you were talking in your first instance, and we talked about this before, that, that one of the major questions has to do with uh, tourism. And one of the great joys I've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, and you folks are a good part of this, 
has been the rapid expansion of wilderness tourism, adventure tourism, outdoor recreation tourism, things of that sort. That stuff's very much at risk now. Why? Because almost all the companies are fairly small. They're almost all local. They're almost all new. They maybe got four or five years of operation. They aren't 30, 40, 50 year companies with a million, two million dollars in the bank. Yep. Um, they're actually sort of family operations. You know, so when the business goes down, it's not just one employee who loses their job. It's actually the mother, the father, and all five kids. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. you, you know those companies, they're fabulous. And and they when you when you happen into one at a fishing camp or or you know in a, in, in a uh, helicopter skiing operation, you think, oh, what a what a great life these folks have. Yeah. Well, you know, what do you do when you don't have any business for two years? Yep. And, 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 and you hit it on the nose. We 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 have this this one company that we uh, we heard through is they're uh, they're selling all their kayaks, all their canoe equipment. They're selling everything just to pay bills. They're selling their inventory, their product, what they make their life on. So that's the first thing they're all getting rid of to to, to pay a bill. And and the small tourism business can and, I, and I'm pretty sure we agree on this is the backbone of tourism. Well, it, it's a it, you know there's there's big tourism and there's small tourism, right? The big tourism are Air Canada, you know, flights bringing people into Toronto to watch the the Raptors play basketball. Yeah. But and big tourism are the cruise ship industry bringing people into Vancouver and up to the Yukon and stuff. Just take the Yukon as an example. The Yukon's basically lost its tourism economy this year. The cruise ships have all canceled their seasons for all the way through to September. They'll this is be four or five ships coming in at a time into into Skagway. Eight, yeah. 9,000 people getting off the ship on a single day, taking the train up to Carcross. Carcross had built a really neat local indigenous business environment where local entrepreneurs were selling handicrafts and food and things like that. To In the that general store? At the, well, Matthew's general store, great place. Polly used to be there. Yeah. Um, it was wonderful, right? And then on to Whitehorse and on to Dawson City. So – They've got hotels in Whitehurst that aren't opening this year. Dawson City is going to be a disaster economically. Yes. You know, and and have you heard any of our political leaders stand up and say, what are we going to do for Dawson City? What are we going to do for Carcross? These nope. are great, great communities that have been doing everything you possibly could for the last decade to make themselves economically viable. These are not places that live on gratuitous handouts every second day. That's when you talk about those small businesses and, this, and, the, and, the, and the, the vitality of rural Canada, yeah. absolutely integrated. And the neatest thing, and you know this, because you're, you're talking, I listened to your soliloquy at the beginning about what a wonderful country we live in and all the great places to see. Well, you're absolutely right. I've had the good fortune to live from the Yukon to New Brunswick and all in BC, all across the prairies and everything like that. I was born in Banff, believe it or not. Okay. Makes, wow. me, makes me an official tourism junkie. From the day I was <laughs> and so these were these are fantastic, you know, opportunities. But if you think over the and you know this very very well over the last ten years, what we've done very very well is fill in all the niches. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a lot of farm tourism before, and you know, in Saskatchewan, we got a whole bunch of places that are doing really neat neat things, really nifty things with sort of farm tourism and sort of get out and chase the cows and you know catch some eggs from the chickens and things of that sort. We've got people who, we got people, exactly, but there it's winter tourism has been picking up greatly. Yellow Knight's getting thirteen thousand people from China a year showing up, ten thousand Japanese showing up every year, building whole new hotels. What's happened to those hotels today? I don't want to. I, I'm sure I know, but that's yeah. a disaster. But but if you think about it, we have a thousand niches in this country, maybe two thousand or ten thousand, and people were filling them in one by one. So it was way more than isolated, you know, fly-in fishing camps, uh, way more than whitewater rafting, which was uh, 20, 30 years ago was sort of this new adventure kind of thing. Now we've got, I I remember looking at this a while ago, at the phenomenal number of photography trips that you can take all across the country. And and in New Brunswick, they, where they have the, in the fall when the leaves change color and the newspapers print the uh, a leaf a leaf monitor that shows you where the where the leaves are changing color, and they've yes. now got people who sort of get up there and they spend a week there following the leaves as they change color throughout the province. Yeah, cool. New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. So yeah. we industry has done this fantastic job of filling in the niches, and those niches one by one are in serious jeopardy today. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the first thing we do is let's start talking about it, talking about it very loudly yep. um, and, and talk about it, not with a sense of 
you know, we got our hands out too kind of thing. But the fact that the country as a whole um, has an opportunity to re recognize, rediscover sort of, uh, you know, rural Canada and small town Canada, wilderness Canada, um, and, and to sort of work with these, these companies in these communities to keep, keep both of them vibrant. Because if not, we lose an awful lot. Yep, totally, and I, and I and I love it that that I think um, I I, th I really I really believe that it's it, the smaller rural communities they got so much to offer, and it's an education process, and that's where we need an education. And I totally agree. We need to all shout loudly. We need to be heard, and 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 it's not for the handout. It's for more of an education purpose. You need to be heard. We need to tell people what's out there, what's available. And, and you've traveled, we've traveled, and some of the best and most of the best adventures we went on happened in like Knights Point, Newfoundland, where population 300. So it's all these little things that you're looking at. So again, with the, we both watched the small towns and the rural towns. And one of the things before, before COVID hit, I think it was on a, uh, it was a Global News article I, I, I watched, and then I went and looked it up. And you basically you were saying that small towns need to reinvent themselves to attract new residents and businesses or fail. And this was in in January, Ken. So now that we're here, what are small towns facing in this new normal? Like where do where do they go? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't help with the fact that we have no idea what new normal looks like. Um, so there is, there is no such thing as new normal. There's there's going to be something very different. Um, and it's like saying, well, what's life like after the next ice age? Well, oh, I don't know. There's lots of ice, a lot colder. I mean, we, we don't know what that looks like, and we don't know when it is. Mm -hmm. So if we had a clear definition, it was September, and tourism was back in full force and all that kind of stuff, we, we'd make do. We'd make temporary measures, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and, and well, we don't think it's going to be September now. Uh, even in universities, universities are talking about not opening in September, maybe going online only, which would be a disaster. Um, going, you know, uh, starting their courses in January, et cetera, et cetera. We know in universities that many people who plan to go to universities won't go because the students have lost their summer money, the parents have lost their job, all the things that we counted on. So let, let's start here and say, okay, where, where are we? I think we're in the 1880s. And if you think of the 1880s in Canada, um, other than the horrible things that happened to First Nations being sort of pushed aside by disease and other things, this was a country that was rediscovered, discovering itself for the first time. People pushed onto the prairies and sort of figured, oh, we can grow stuff here. Or we can't grow stuff here. Um, they moved into British Columbia and set up you know, commercial fishing operations and timber operations and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're in a situation now where our, our geographic layout reflects the realities of the old economy. And now we've got to prepare for something that we don't know. So what's not going to happen? We're not going to get a rapid response return to the oil and gas industry, which I think is a really serious problem for hundreds of small towns across the country. Um, forestry was already in decline and is unlikely to sort of come back in a sort of major way. Uh, tourism has to be reinvented. Um, just to use one example, um, the, the wealthiest 2 or 3% of the population will travel as much, if not more, uh, than they did before. And the big problem for, for most people, most tourism industries, is going to be sort of low-end tourism. So if I was in Las Vegas, I would be weeping right now. Mm -hmm. If I was doing the cruise ship runs from Fort Lauderdale, I would think these are th those buddies who've been coming down once every three years from Iowa and once every three years from, from you know, Vigerville, Alberta, are not coming down anymore yeah. because they lost their farm or they lost their business or something like that. But, you know, the, the 1%, the 2%, even the 10% who have comfortable, good jobs, the doctors, the well, well overpaid university professors and all these guys, <laughs> those folks are going to be okay. <clears throat> and so that means that if you, if you look at this properly and say, all right, do we have something to sell them to the, the, to the super rich? And I don't mean people who are worth, you know, $10 million a year. Anybody who makes over 200000 those folks are likely to be okay, and they're still going to be traveling. So is the tourism side, how do we get those folks there? So the, the whitewater rafting down the Firth River is probably going to do better than the whitewater rafting in the, in the, in the, the rivers around Jasper uh, because Jasper is you know, low cost, close and accessible people who go camping. The Firth River, you have to fly into Old Crow in, in the far north and then get a helicopter out to the start of the river. You know, that's expensive stuff. Yeah. So I think the high-end things are sort of going to be okay. 
Um, recognize, too, that in these kind of crises, and this is one that's hard to get your head around, when you have a financial crisis like this, the people who still have jobs and still have good incomes see their standard of living go up. So when your friends are losing, your neighbors are losing their jobs, and people down the street are losing their jobs, all of a sudden it's cheaper to get your, your grass mowed, your house painted, all those kinds. You can get a nanny if you want because people can't find work, and so they're looking for anything they can find. And when you have this kind of an economic distress, the people who are comfortable get more comfortable, which is an irony and a sadness. Yes. So think about this thing mm. that part through. Um, but I think the other part of it is let's also realize that that in this crazy world we're in right now, on the one hand, you have the Internet and the Internet economy and all the things you can do with that. On the other hand, you have the digital rapidly changing technologies, automated this is an automated that's yep. going to change things as well. Um, so what you actually need is a situation I've seen in other places, particularly in Scandinavia, where the community say, what are we going to do to survive? So just a small story, if I can bore you with the story. I hope you don't mind. Please do. Um, Go right ahead. I don't we, think there's one person bored right now. No, no one's saying bored, Kevin. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we, were, we were up in uh, Ar Arjeplog. My, my wife pronounces it better than I do in Sweden. It's a small town. Um, if you go to Stockholm and go 900 kilometers north and then go 400 kilometers into the mountains, you get to Arjeplog. And this is a four, small forestry town, kind of um, it would be like, like Clearwater, British Columbia. You know, sort of that, that kind of a place. Up in the mountains, good forestry and indigenous population, Sami hunter, herders and things of that sort. And the forest industry starts to close down. So the community gets together and says, well, we're dead, right? You know, we're going to lose this plant. We're going to lose people here. So what do we do? What do we do as a for our future economy? And somebody in the community basically says, and I'm, I'm making a long story very short, the only thing we got going for us is winter. So Argentina, Sweden is now the world's largest winter car testing site. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. We have thousands of people who come in every year from Audi, Mercedes, Saab, all these, you know, Citron, all these companies. That's brilliant. Send their cars up there. They test the tires. They test the brakes. They test the engines. They test the oil. They do this kind of stuff. And their economy is turned upside down. And so instead of it being a summer place with a lot of logging going on and people coming up for fishing and canoeing and camping, now all of a sudden it's a winter place. And one person told me in town that they that they have uh, they have more snowmobiles than women in the in the city. I mean, <laughs> this is a wind classic winter town that has these very expensive engineers flying up from all over Europe to test the cars for winter winter activity. And they now you know in this part of it this, this area controls by itself one community of about twelve hundred people, about one third of all the winter automobile testing in the world. Wow. Wow. You know, and they've got a very stable but odd economy because we were there. We were there before the season started, so in early November, and the winter season hadn't really started in earnest yet. And the hotels were empty, and there's nobody in the restaurants. Mm. And I said, "Whoa, this is kind of depressing." I said, oh, "I'll come yeah. back in three weeks from now, and every restaurant, every hotel room is taken, and every restaurant seat is filled." <laughs> so, so that's a situation where a community basically, you know, thought very seriously about what's going on. How are we going to respond to all of this? How are we going to take advantage of this? Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting. I, I noticed that Suzanne Cavanaugh, as you're talking here and your thing about, about New Zealand, I used to live in New Zealand. Uh -huh. and New Zealand small towns are some of the most brilliant in the world, where they just basically say, we, we live in paradise. Yeah. And we're darn lucky to live here. And so we're going to try to find economic activity that fits with the kind of lifestyle that we want. There's been communities that have said no to oil and gas exploration offshore, that have discovered new tourism sort of techniques, that have gone to craft, craft um, um, you know, handicraft manufacturing to sort of develop an industry. Yeah. The whole thing actually has to start with, with the communities figuring out who they are, uh, what they are, mm -hmm. and do they want to stay there? And I always think the, the, the beginning point for any of this is, you know, what do we get to, to make sure that our kids have a chance to come home? Mm. A lot of very times, nice from small towns. Kids will often leave. They go to college, yep. go to polytech, go to university, they do whatever right. they want, and they grow. You know, quite frankly, my, my mother was a lovely human being, and when I was eighteen, <laughs> I would need lots of money to get thousands of miles away from her. So, yep. getting away from your mother is a rite of passage, right? You just do that as a natural thing. Yeah. So, so I was happy to, to do that, but you know, I've been going back up to the Yukon constantly. I love the Yukon; it's a fabulous place. So. Yep. You have to work on this by saying we can't necessarily keep our kids tied down here forever. But if they go away and want to come home, do we have something for them? 
Yeah. And what would that look like? And it's partly lifestyle and it's quality of life. It's not, it's not wealth and prosperity necessarily at the highest level, but you have to have a job. Yeah. People need to have work. And so that's a community enterprise. And if you sort of look across the place, there's absolutely no way that Queen Charlotte City is going to come up with exactly the same strategy as Laurent, Saskatchewan. Yep. There's absolutely no way that mm -hmm. St. Andrews in New Brunswick is going to sort of look around and say, okay, we're going to be the same as, um, you know, goodness knows, uh, Capus Casing in northern Ontario. Yep. So Bingo. Each community has to sort of sit down and decide for itself what kind of future it wants. Yep. Uh, and, that, and that is so true. We can't and, – and, and one of the things we noticed when we were looking around is, is a lot pre-COVID anyways, a lot of the, the marketing models out there for communities, can are built for urban centers. And, oh, and that's a big problem. That's a big problem. No one can afford the staff time, funding, skill set to run these programs. So, yeah, and I like it. And the, and the examples of um, – the communities where they're what they what they're doing is they're looking at their physical inventory, they're looking at what they've got to work with, and then they're making their own industry out of it. The car story is brilliant. That's a great story. It's, well, it's I'll, a, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two others. Just, and and this these are from our one trip over to uh, we have been over to Finland many times. Um, one of the great stories actually happened uh, about twenty five years ago, and a town called Rovaniemi, Finland, was sort of struggling with the fact that it wasn't a very successful. What was it? It was a forestry town. And it was it tore down about maybe 25, 30,000 people, but sort of a you know small Prince Georgie kind of thing. And they and they were it was a good good solid regional community, but they decided to do something. They decided that Santa Claus lived in Roman Navy Finland. Now, <laughs> now you know that's a lie because we all know that Santa Claus is Canadian. Yes, yeah. but, but the Finns kidnapped Santa Claus, and they decided that Santa <laughs> Claus lived because Roman Navy is right on the Arctic Circle in Finland, and and they did really well. And now, now, how well does, does that mean? Well, they now have a massive industry. It's in real trouble this year. They would get tens and hundreds of thousands of people a year coming to, to Santa Claus Village. Direct flights from China and Japan. Direct flights from Rome and London every day coming in, flying wow. in, people by the hundreds to buy little Santa Claus trinkets and to sit on Santa's knee. And, <laughs> and it was a massively successful enterprise. So just about maybe 300 kilometers from Rovaniemi um, is a lovely little town called Haparenga. And Haparenga is right on the border of Sweden and Finland if you go up in the far north, um, on the Bothnian, the Bothnian Sea, so it's, it's pretty close to the ocean. And their, their economy is collapsing, traditional economy, forestry, mining base, et cetera, et cetera. Can't keep the young people at home. So what they did was they actually approached the, the founder of Ikea and said, we want to build an Ikea store here. So Haparanga has, has um, uh, what would it be, maybe 10,000 people. Um, there's another community across the border, a Finnish community, Trivoli, that's only, I think they have maybe another 10, 15,000 people. So not even close. You know, you don't get an Ikea unless you have, you know, Saskatoon doesn't have one, right? Yeah. 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 Half a million, a million kind of people. So they worked on this guy for a while, and the founder said, well, you know, yeah, we we the only IKEA in the far north. People will drive long distances. They'll come from Rovaniemi and come from many other places. So Ludio, seventy-seven thousand people, is located about maybe maybe fifty, sixty kilometers away. So they built an IKEA there, yeah, in this small town, and wow. and, is, and, and you, you know this is Prince Albert. Yeah, they, yeah. You know, that kind of that size of a city, and smaller than Prince Albert. Now they have an IKEA. Guess what happens? A bunch of other stores come in, hotels come in, tourists come in in huge numbers. The economy is <laughs> very much stronger, more robust. Oh, because these tourists are there, now you got to do touristy things. So they brought an old polar icebreaker, put it into the Bothian Peninsula. In the middle of the winter time, you can actually go and jump on this polar icebreaker and go walk on the ice. Nice, and nice. And go swimming in the ice in, in you know those um, life saving suits that they have. Yeah. <laughs> and they sold thousands and thousands of tickets including direct air flights from Asia who wow. want to come there to go swimming in the art in the in the ocean in the in the Arctic, wow. Arctic waters as you see right yeah. so I, I keep using these examples of, of of sort of smaller towns smaller regions that sort of just get their act together and figure out how where they can go yeah you know, and and you've got you've got Canada has some communities that have done this Shimanis did this years ago uh, Caslo in British Columbia beautiful beautiful yeah. place. Um, has decided to reinvent itself in some wonderful ways. There yep. are communities that have done this, 
Um, I think you're seeing Prince Rupert has gone from a, a different kind of community than it was a few years ago, largely by embracing real partnerships with First Nations for the mm -hmm. first time. Whitehorse has become one of the most competitive small business environments in Canada. That's not what you expect in the far north. So yeah. you can do this if communities, your point, drop this stuff about trying to replicate big city operations. Yep. So for example, mm -hmm. when Richard Florida was out telling everybody about the creative class, we had seminars offered all across the world about how you know creative building a creative economy and doing this and that. Well, if you copy what everybody else is doing, you're not being <laughs> very creative. Nope. In I don't mean borrowing everybody else's idea. It means figure out what yeah. works for you, make yourselves distinctive, and, yep. and and build off it, right? And and we've seen some in different parts of the world some great examples of this. And it's been my one of our great joys academically is to have a chance to do all of that kind of traveling and see these amazing locations. It's a whole learning process, right, Ken? It is. It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I'm talking way too much, so I apologize. You probably oh won't. no 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 no! This is no, why we keep bring. Going. This is why <laughs> this is why we bring you guys on is to to help out the Canadian uh, small rurals and to help out tourism innovation. And I mean, we all have. I think a lot of us that come on this show, anyway. So far, all the all the guests so far, um, we're all very passionate about the same thing, and that's why it's important. I think that we share these ideas and and try and educate, you know, who we can about that. So. If that's the case, Ken, about how we're, how, and, and this is funny because when I go public speak, I, I hit that point exactly about taking what your community has and, and trying to identify where you're good at and, and develop industry and develop your brand mm -hmm. on that. Another one is, uh, you know, storm watching where Tofino had a two month season and, and Ukula had a two month season. They brought in storm watching. Now they can't even keep their pre COVID. They can't, yep. they didn't have enough accommodations. Yeah. Um, sometimes even a coat of paint i mean look at halifax <laughs> i mean look at how they get their their or not halifax lunenburg look at the yeah, coat right. of paint they use on all their newfoundland homes i mean that's an attraction in itself yeah, oh, yeah. and it, it it you just have to be different and distinctive and quite frankly it's kind of an interesting piece because i say this as a very proud canadian is you yeah. actually just have to be proud of what you're doing Bingo. And, yes. and pride pride sort of just sort of bubbles out and, and people come to visit, and they go, oh, why do I like this place so much? Well, because everybody here was darn proud of it, excited and to be to yep. be there, to welcome you into the community and things of that sort. Yep. Um, you know, it was one of these things I, I noticed in New Zealand when I lived down there, my wife is a describer as an energizer bunny. She never stops moving. And so we had to visit basically every single part of New Zealand <laughs> from the top of the south <laughs> coast to west coast, which you can all do in a day, by the way. Yeah. Um, um, but we loved New Zealand and traveled around a lot. But every community had this stunning, um, uh, you know, what we call topophilia, which is love of place. And I love that word, you know, love of to topophilia, love of place. And yeah, you can tell place. whether people have it or not. And don't, this, because in this way, I don't want to make this, you say the names of these communities. There are many, many communities in Canada where you walk in there and you think, eh, these people don't care much about their home hometown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the downtowns, you know, well, it's interesting. Use you an example again. Rural Manitoba, for the last number of years, there's been a remarkable effort to revitalize downtown, the, the downtowns of the small towns, to raise money and to actually fix up the storefronts, you know, to paint the buildings, to make them all look the same sort of way. This is kind of like they try to do in places like Gravelburg in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the, the, another example, I've, I've heard some three different times, I've heard the mayor and some of the community leaders of Maple Creek, Saskatchewan. And you know where Maple Creek is? It's across the border from Alberta. Mm -hmm. I'm short, on sort of the entrance way to the, the Cypress Hills uh, uh, Park. Um, it, it's, it's a really interesting place. Well, this this little town has its uh, bit in its mouth. And it's decided that it's going to be good. And it's going to be really good. And we're going to be proud of what we're doing. And we're not going to try to be everything to everybody. And they're not going after Ikea. And they're not trying to build, you know, a 500-room Hilton hotel. They're just going to make every store as nice as the store can be and everybody as friendly as they can be. Nice. So there are there are some really good things. Yes. Yes. And they, don't they have don't they have a real uh, one of the oldest hotels down there, too, in Maple Creek, a historic hotel? Oh, I don't know. That's that's good. I'll check it out. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think they might. Uh, what do you envision in the field of innovation contributing to the revitalization process? If how important is innovation and technology going to be in a recovery of our northern communities, small and rural? And how important do you think it's going to be? There's tons of new stuff coming out. 
Yeah, and there's well, so here's here's the downer part of my talk, right? Yeah. Um, it is going to be very tough. There's no easy rides, no easy rides here whatsoever. And in fact, most of the symbols are for sort of decline. Um, young people are leaving and don't want to stay. Um, yeah. I just see Dorothy's writing here from Prince George. I, I was involved with setting up the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George. Um, now a long time ago, I used to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, a good shout out. And, and, and what a what a great institution that's turned out to be. And and. And Prince George is a really good example of a community that decided to be something different than it was. It didn't turn its back on forestry. It didn't say we're not going to do what we're going to do. But and this is important to connect up what you're talking about. One of the reasons that they made such an effort to get the university there was they were modernizing the, the sawmills and the pulp plants in Prince George. And they knew they were going to lose thousands of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and they knew that was happening. And so as the community leaders were sitting, I think, well, what do we do? Well, the new economy is going to look different. Don't know where it's going. We do know that universities are a big part of this. And they fought like crazy to get a university up there. And I think it succeeded extremely well. The university's doing extremely nicely. Um, and the communities benefit a thousand ways from that. Okay. So here's my, here's my answer to your question, um, because I think it's a really important one for right now. Uh, technology has the potential to destroy rural life as we know it. It has the potential to undermine it systematically. It has the potential, if left unchecked and allowed to sort of evolve naturally, to push us toward an urban city-state economy where not just 100% of the jobs are, are across Canada are created there, but 200% of them because the rest of the country is hollowing out very quickly. So it has the potential to do that. And there are not very many places that are actually beating that back. Argyll Plog is a really good example. Heparenda is a really good example. These places in Sweden, Rovaniemi with Santa Claus Village. You know, we have some examples of places that are doing that, and it's great. I'd um, love to see them actually happening. Um, so, but the flip side of it is with emerging technologies, there's absolutely no limit to what we can do. You can have, you know, the, the relocation of manufacturing. I would love to see rural Canada become the number one place in the world for dealing with 3D printing. So right now, 3D printing, you can do a whole bunch of things. Like you can make a new doorknob. Um, you can make a new bolt for your for your whatever engine or what do you want to call about, right? But this stuff is evolving very, very quickly. So if we have 3D printers that can produce body parts. Good, chop your ear off with an axe. We can do a 3D printer, put your ear on a mold, put it back on there and sew it back into your ear the same day. Wow. This is not this is not sciencey fiction. It never happened in our lifetime. This is stuff sort of going on now, and you start thinking about where this goes. Um, I'm a huge fan, for example, of 3D printed houses, and you okay. think of the cost of building houses in in remote regions. So you're up there at Fort Ware. I don't know if you guys have been to Fort Ware up in northern British Columbia, mm -hmm. or or over to Dee's Lake or some isolated places or way yeah. off, a long way down the line, right? Yeah. So I can take a, a there's certain machines. There's a Canadian company based in uh, based in, in Vancouver that actually has this technology. You can you can take the stuff in on a boat, on a helicopter, or whatever else, and in 48 hours you can print yourself a thousand square foot house. Whoa! <laughs> I'm, so you got to hear the price, though, because that'll get you, and then you'll be less enthusiastic. It'll cost you about forty thousand dollars. Whoa! And we can do uh, this today. This is not going to happen thousand years from now or anything like that. Wow. Right? Yeah. We can do these things now. And so, if rural Canada became the place in the world where community after community experimented with new technologies. And said, you know, well, use another example. This is because we're all getting kind of old. Um, we have the capacity now with remote surgery to do surgical operations in all sorts of different places. We can take a machine, take it into your local your local health station, hook it up, and somebody can actually take out your appendix from Vancouver. Oh. Actually, they can take out your appendix from, from wow. Taiwan or Thailand. It'll be even cheaper. Now, now, unless you're dying, you probably would say, I'd rather just drive to Nelson. Yeah. Uh, not going to get this done, you know. Sort of my, you know, I'm kind of scared about this stuff. Yeah. But you know, let's do let's do this this um, for pets first or something like that, right? Let's yeah. become the part of the world that everybody says rural Canada is the most experientially minded place. They'll take on any new technology. They'll invite companies in. They'll do all these kinds of things: healthcare, education, retail shopping. We. People say, oh, e-commerce is taking over the world. E-commerce is about 5% of what it will be 20 years from now. And wouldn't you rather be the place that reinvented e-commerce so it served rural areas instead yes. of e-commerce destroying stores? 
Yep. We, we all know stories of stores. I used to with the wonderful folks in Stratford, Ontario, one of my very, very favorite places in Canada. Beautiful That's a sad city. Story. Wonderful, wonderful, um, um, you know, uh, mayor. Um, but they lost most of their automobile manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. And they're really interested in sort of reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do these things. We can do yep. these things in so many different sorts of ways. And we can do it with crafts. We can do it with culture. We can do it with tourism. We can do it with manufacturing. Um, we can do it through um, education. You know, there's you, you think of, you know, when you guys are describing all the wonderful places across Canada, and they are wonderful, um, you know, why do we do our education stuck in classrooms, you know, <laughs> in a big city, these places that look like they're, they look halfway between sort of a, a, a hospital morgue and a, and a prison cell, you know, yes. and, and this is a place to go and learn. Good gracious, you know, let's get our students moving, move them across the country, have a, a week here and a week there and do your. Oh, uh, wouldn't that be a yeah. great program? Imagine doing your marine biology in in at Bamfield, on the west coast of Vancouver yeah. Island, yeah. and go up into Canmore and do some wonderful sort of mountaineering sort of work for a cup for a month or so, you know, and bump across the country. And wow, what a program that would be! Yes, you don't, you don't think we couldn't get a thousand people in Canada to get excited about that? Well, you, you got know, two. Yeah. You got you two know, right here, Ken. You know, <laughs> this could be for high school kids or university kids. And you don't think we could get philanthropists who believe in this country to say, you're going to get the ultimate Canadian diploma. Yep. You're going to go and, and you're going to be in all 13 jurisdictions, 10, 10 provinces. Wow, and would that be? But, but yeah. imagine, well, tell, tell me what happens in Canmore. Somebody here has noted that Canmore has had a real, real serious problem with um, – Yep. Uh, with uh, unemployment because the Banff was shut down entirely and, and I'm sure yep. the whole Kananaskis area is in real difficulty. So you don't think over time that Canmore wouldn't like to have a thousand kids coming in for a week at a time over the course of a year and having all the people there looking and showing them how to do the mountains and sowing the animals and all this kind of stuff? Yep. What an amazing year that would be. Yep. And instead we take some kids and wealthy kids and we put them in you know boarding schools where they you know sit in away from their house and sort of only experience that one, one place. I, I just use these as examples. You know, we can do amazing things in this new economy. And yes. if, if we're creative about it and look at that technology from our user point of view mm -hmm. and, and sort of see ourselves. I mean, what, don't, right now, people do not look at rural Canada and see it as the most innovative place in the world. <laughs> if you go back to 1910, 1920, you know, guess what the most innovative place in the world was? It was rural Canada. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they were you're experimenting with new machinery, experimenting with new farm techniques. In the 1930s, they reinvented tillage so they could actually save the, the dust bowl on the prairies and find new ways of actually you know, keeping everything uh, vibrant and alive. Um, so we used to be great at this stuff. I loved in New Zealand. It was great, great. But, but New Zealand sort of has this, the Kiwi way. And yeah. the Kiwi way is, you know, this in constant inventiveness, you know, you know, give me some bailing wire and I can fix anything. <laughs> and, and, and that's actually the, the whole spirit of the play. Well, they need duct tape too, bailing yeah. wire and duct tape, and they can sort of do heart surgery. Um, and, and, and I think we could rediscover that. Now we don't have that. And in fact, what's happening in the prairies, for example, is we're bringing in ever more expensive machines to sort of replace human beings on ever larger farms. Yeah, and, and we're going the opposite direction. So, you know, if rural Canada wants a future, it's it's there. It's there for the taking. Yep, I like it, and I and I right. totally agree. It is there for the taking, and it's people like you, Ken, that's that are making a difference. And uh, I I cannot tell you how glad uh, uh, I am that we connected. Before we let you go, um, if you were to give um, some advice to uh, the audience, to Canadians, to uh, everybody involved. Uh, urban and small and rural, northern and south, what would you give them? Um, basically, start building your pride from the community out. Um, each community should start you know, talking amongst themselves about what future they envision for themselves, what special characteristics, unique opportunities and things they have to, they have to develop. Um, don't wait for crisis to hit before when we're in one now. Mm -hmm. um, but don't wait for a crisis to hit before you start sort of laying out your vision for the future. Um, make sure that governments understand that you are open to technology, that you want to be a testing ground for the newest technologies yes. in the world. Yeah. Re reach out to businesses. You know, if you had a situation, I've, my wife is the president of the Japan Studies Association of Canada. 
So we actually spend a lot of time in Japan, and she studies innovation. And we keep thinking, you know, let's go and find the research directors at five of the biggest you know, Japanese innovation companies. And these are Panasonic and they're Mitsubishi and they're Hitachi. They're doing amazing things over there that we're not going to see in Canada for 10 years. And they're half, half of all the homes built in Japan are called net zero homes. They actually produce more electricity than they consume, more energy than they consume. Okay. They're already nice. there. We sit there, we get one on our street, we go, ooh, look at those here, innovative people. <laughs> <laughs> All the new houses in Japan are new, are net zero, right? Wow. Get, get the people from those companies to come over and say, we're going to give you a tour of 30 small towns across Canada. And we're going to come in there and say, we want to be your test bed. You know, you can, anybody can test things in a big city. You test it in Tokyo, you test it in Toronto. They're all the same thing, yeah. a little bit different cultures. But be, come to these small towns, and we'll, we'll show you hot climates, wet climates, cold climates, winter climates, summer climates, dry climates. We'll show you everything, right? Yeah. Bring those technologies in and let us test them and, and make, make people take notice. You know, and you don't you don't get people taking notice by asking for handouts. You don't get people to take notice by asking for yet another government grant. Um, my one of my greatest concerns in Canada, we're turned into a nation of grant writers, mm-hmm. where we we you know we were placed entrepreneurship with grant writers. I used to have a joke. They say, well, you know, how what's the description of a successful Canadian entrepreneur? And well, they applied for two grants one year, not just one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, that's not right. I mean, you, we obviously the grants are there, and you have to go after them. I know I'm not disparaging that, but we have to think really carefully about the culture we're creating, where we're mm-hmm. waiting for government to give us something. Mm-hmm. Do it for ourselves, and the government will come running to you. One of the joys of I worked at University of Waterloo for five years. Great, great city, great university, and the governments of Canada, both conservative and liberal governments, couldn't stay away from Waterloo. You know, hey, do you guys want to grant today? We're going to come down and get our picture taken, right? Okay, and yeah. To come to Waterloo to the university, to Wilfrid Laurier University, Conestoga College. This place was just bubbling with innovation. And they were there all the time giving out money and wanting to be sort of the, the, the near brush with fame and to sort of show that they were part of the innovative world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely true. And, and you need to have that same cachet around, around rural Canada. You need to have the prime minister of the country – not going to Tofino to take his shirt off and do selfies on the beach. You yeah. Need to- I wish I could <laughs> high five you, Ken. <laughs> yeah. You need to have the prime minister come to Caslow because he's heard that Caslow's reinventing rural Canada. Yep. And and you need him to want to be there because there are actually literally dozens and dozens of rural constituencies in this country that could determine the shape of the next government. Mm-hmm. And right now, the last government was elected almost entirely in the cities. They have almost no rural presence whatsoever. Yep. You need to get them realizing that rural Canada is central to the future of the country in every single way. Wow. Great nice. stuff, Ken. Uh, thank it. you very much. This is uh, Professor Kent Coates, University of Saskatchewan professor, Canadian Region Research Chair in Regional Innovation, McDonald Laurier Institute Senior Policy Fellow in Aboriginal and Northern Canadian Issues, writer of 12 books, very knowledgeable, great man, good word, good good spokesperson for small and rural northern communities. And again, Ken, Ken thank you for joining us today. I hope you come back. Yeah, anytime you want me, I'll be there, boys. Take care. Thank you, Ken. Thank, Loved you, it. Ken. thank you, all the people for writing in. It was great to sort of see folks from across the country. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Take care, guys. You're a big man. Thanks, Ken. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ken. Bye now. So that was awesome. Wow, that was like awesome I'm a big sure. I'm a big Ken Coates fan. I'll tell you right now, <laughs> I'm a groupie. Yeah, I mean he's just he's just a great guy. He's he's good thinker. He's got his heart's in the right place. Um, fantastic job. And that was again. Uh, you can find uh, Ken Coates. He's at the University of Saskatchewan. He um he does some public speaking. If you want him to come talk to you, make sure that uh, you tell Ken you want me to come along as his little tag along buddy. Um, and, uh, and Ken is a knowledgeable, knowledgeable, knowledgeable stuff. So, um, because he was so knowledgeable, we didn't get a chance to share some of this, uh, some, some of the people there. So Dorothy here, Dorothy's saying hi, she's going great presentation. I'm sure that was Ken, not us call. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) thank you, Dorothy. Um, nice to see you come back again. We have uh, Linda Pianozzi, who will be a guest. She says, fantastic session. Thank you. 
Um, uh, Christine here, she, she's, she says she wants to teach these kids in, uh, in Ken's, uh, Ken's land. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. We had Suzanne here that was on. Sorry, we couldn't put a lot more out there, but hey, Ken had the floor and uh, he was rocking it, Colin. Yeah, it was great to hear what he had to say. Yes, I mean, it was. the experience and the knowledge. And so the, the show went, uh, because it was so good, I mean, I want I, I want to ask Ken like 18 billion more questions. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, we, I think we should have like a marathon. We're going to finish off with our isolation vacation, our surprise favorite destination. Uh, we'll finish with that. Uh, I'm going to say a shout out to Ma Gerard, who made 300 masks on her own and delivered them to a senior's home. And I'm going to show you a picture for Ma Gerard. This is just incredible. So there she is, uh, yes. not charging, done it on her own time. And she delivered 300 to a Vancouver Island seniors home to protect the seniors there. And it's hashtag seniors, number four seniors, seniors for seniors. So right on, mom. Where's no proud of you, mom? Yeah, way to go, Gerard. And uh, I, again, hats off to Ken Coates. And again, my brother Colin, we didn't have to do much. Ken did all the work today, Call. Yeah, yeah. Ken was a heavy lifter. It was great. Yep, yep. So we'll see you next week, Tuesday, 7 p.m. live Facebook. Thank you, everybody. Love you. Um, as we always, you know, stay safe, stay positive, stay home, and play later on acanadatravel.com. Remember, where you book, where you plan is who you support. Support Canadian. We rock it out, man, and we want you guys to, <laughs> to grow it, and we're having fun sharing yeah. knowledge, education, and experiences with Canadians. So we're going to leave you with, it's called the isolation vacation. Hey bro, talk to you in a bit and we'll see everyone next week. Well then bro. Thanks everybody. Egypt Falls. Nova Scotia, near Bathurst.